Hi, Michael. It's so yeah. lovely to see you. Thank you nice so to see much. You too. Nice to see really, you. really lovely to um, that you agreed to have this conversation with me um, in this very strange time. And I think yeah. you're yeah. in Devon right now. Is that right? I'm in Devon. We live down a little lane in the middle of nowhere in Devon. And it's actually quite a good place to be in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, and I'm lucky because when we go for our walks, we can just walk out onto the farm, down through a bluebell wood to the river. Um, and no one comes and no one goes. So where are, you can't say you're in no danger, but you're in very little danger. And our neighbours are really sweet because we're the, the wrong side of 75. We have to stay inside. We're not allowed. We're such a danger to the community. We have to stay inside and hunker down. So that's what we do. And all the people around here, it's really sweet. Um, I think they, for the first time, they've realised we're quite old. And we've realised we're quite old because they're treating us as if we were quite old. And it's lovely because they bring us, I mean, we have got so many eggs to eat, you've got no idea. Um, it's, it's wonderful. So our egg collection is building up and they, they go shopping for us and they come in and we feel very spoiled, actually, spoiled rotten. It's lovely, isn't it? I, we found that um, neighbours that we didn't know before we are um, having a connection with yeah. and my daughter Sophie is baking. She loves baking. Um, but yeah. we've got we've got too many things to eat. So we've actually she wanted to share with the neighbours. So we're yeah. leaving little packages yeah. uh, on doorsteps and stuff. And there's something very lovely about that, isn't it? Well, it's it, yeah. it's. It's interesting when you, the word neighbour is it describes that they're living close to you, but it doesn't mean to say you know them. And actually what's happened is our neighbours have become friends mm -hmm. um, out of necessity. And I'm really glad it's happened because we've got to know them as, as people. Um, whereas before we would wave and it was all very friendly and fine. But we didn't know them at all. And you're getting to know that everyone's living under anxiety mm -hmm. and everyone's missing their mums, their dads, their children, their grandchildren. So we've got an awful lot in common that we're, we're living through and that brings people together. And Yes, absolutely. Uh, I was listening to your um, Radio 4 interview about, um, you know, separation and coming together. And it seems that this really is a time for us to just pause a little bit. And when we can relax in... Uh, you know, and not this frenzied going around for me, yeah. touring, going out, you signing and, you know, being in demand. Um, it gives you a moment to contemplate relationships and what's really important. Yeah, it does. I mean, there's, there's a wonderful line in a poem about standing and staring. Mm. And this gives us room and time. You're right, not to be busy. And um, suddenly we're taking our time over everything. I mean, we have a, our days are much like everyone else's. It's a, it's a sort of routine of the day, which is quite gentle. Um, we take time over things. I wash up more than I did before. Yeah. I cook more than I did before. Mm. I'm going to clean the silver this afternoon. Imagine the excitement that's going to be. Oh, well, that's a lot. Marvellous. It's, it, it's funny. because Actually, what's really, I joke about it, but I'm really looking forward to it. You know, I mean, it's these little things... Um, it, it's the sort of things you left undone because you didn't feel like doing them. And there was something always more important to do. Yeah. Well, actually, there's not. You know, this is keeping your place. It's keeping your cave clean. Yeah. And it's it's paying some attention to the person uh, you're, you live with rather than sort of rushing past. And, and she's busy doing one thing. I mean, the only problem we've got, I mean, we, we're on this with this wonderful technology, which is terrific. We can communicate. And without it, goodness knows where we'd be. But because that is now the only way of... Uh, communicating by phone or by this sort of thing um it it, it, it becomes very time consuming yeah. um when you like doing it which i do with this it's fine um but it, i think can become that can become just as oppressive as the other thing if you're not careful and um and i find it quite tiring to be on phone calls and on zoom it's it's almost as if it it takes more to connect with somebody when you're at this sort of distance than when you're sitting in a room together. Well, there is, and there's the thing of, I mean, I, I'm, I'm feeling very smug, really, because yeah. this is the first technological thing I've been able to work. And even then, as you'll know, before this conversation, I had to email you and say, where's the code? Because you'd sent it already, but I didn't recognise it. I mean, I'm so unfamiliar with all this stuff. 
Yes. And actually, bit by bit by bit, I'm gaining quite a lot of confidence, um, not massively, but quite a lot of confidence, yeah. uh, and quite enjoying that side of things. So, yeah. and I don't know, it's wonderful to be able to see people on the other side of the world. I've got grandchildren who live a lot in France, so we can, you know, Zoom them, and um, they can see um, how we are, which I think they're quite interested in. I'm certainly seeing how how they are and how they're looking and how they're feeling, and I, I love that. I mean, we're, yeah. we're, we're very, very lucky to have this kind of connection, that's for yes. sure. And and we must, absolutely. We must, we must remember that actually the vast numbers of people in this country don't have that connection. That's the, the, the very old who mm. either can't afford it or can't work it, and then the very young as well who don't have the money to have these sort of machines. It does, I don't know, it makes you very privileged to be able to do it in a sense because, you know, I can afford an iPad and um, it's fine, but there are plenty of houses where that isn't the case and plenty of old people who are, Alone, alone, alone. I think almost the worst thing apart from is the anxiety and the fear is that there is a terrific sense of loneliness, I think, which old people are going through. And of course, the threat is greatest for them and they know it and they can feel isolated. But as you say, a lot of people are rallying around and helping. And we're finding out, I think, the best of us in this situation with him. But what I really do hope is that after it's all done, and it, of course, won't be done in the sense that it'll be a final thing. But once there is a vaccine and we can go about more what i hope is we don't forget what we've learned about each other during it because what has happened which is probably the best thing that's happened is we don't take anything for granted anymore yeah. we don't take our neighbors for granted for instance mm. we don't take our doctors and our nurses and our care homes for granted anymore you know and we i mean i was around in 1947 when the national health service happened i didn't know a world without it the only operation, well, the first operation I've had in my life was when I was a little boy, I had an ear operation, saved my life. I didn't, all, all I wanted to do was to go home. Um, I didn't think about it. And after that, I never thought of it. You go to the doctor, you get your medicines. It's there for you, it's there for you. It takes something like this for us all to sort of sit and hang on. These are the people who make it all work, you know? Yeah. And it's the same thing with your teachers. I was going to say, yeah, I mean, what, what, what's something? Do. Huge. So what's actually happening now for the first time in many children's lives is they're really missing school. Mm. And the parents, which is also quite interesting, are learning, some of them for the first time, what it is to be a teacher. Mm. And they've got one or two or three to cope with. And they'll be thinking, my goodness me, that teacher is coping with 35 of them. And more respect will come. And I think it's the respect that we have for other people's work. I mean, because I'm home, not going anywhere, I'm here every single time the dustman comes. And I'm there to talk to him, standing in my pyjamas on the other side of the gate. And we have a chat. I've never chatted to them before. They come and do it and they go on. And again, we take it for granted. So I, I just hope that after it is over, we, we remember that my godmother said something to me, which um, perhaps I'll, I'll mention. She was a wonderful old lady, a lady called Mary Niven, and she lived up in Edinburgh. And um, when I got, we used to go up to the Edinburgh Festival, I would always either stay with her or we'd see her or whatever. I mean, she got older and older, she, she died sadly not long ago. Um, but almost the last time I saw her, she'd always give me a sort of word of advice and she would waggle her slightly crooked finger. And she said the last time I left, virtually the last time I think, she said, what's the last time? She said, Michael, I want you to remember that everyone matters. Mm. Yeah, golly. Yeah. Yeah. Truth. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Golly. And um and one of the things that we've been doing, thinking about people who aren't as lucky as we are, um when they're when they're in their you know, individually or with small groups, just their family groups, is how occasions, particularly birthdays, for example, really, really matter. Um, how do we help make a birthday as special and as memorable? Um, because we all have birthdays and they are important days to actually acknowledge somebody and say, you know, we love you and we're delighted you're here. And it must be strange for small children um, for, to suddenly not have those 
traditions and rituals that they used to. So we've been putting things together of how to make memorable birthdays and beautiful birthdays. But I wanted to ask you if you celebrate birthdays in any particular way in your family or if there are any traditions or ways of of being together even if you're apart i i would say we have a, a traditional way of doing christmas very which is a birthday after all yes uh, and we have very traditional ways of doing that we have a kind of complete ritual although when i see my sons all grown up now with their own families they do christmas their own way but they do take on board some of the rituals that they had when they were younger as well. And I quite like that. They, they change it, they, yeah. and that, that's fine. That's true. When it comes to birthdays, the older I've got, really, the more we do these birthdays, Claire and myself, together. And to some extent, since we're together all the time, um, you have to work quite hard to make it new and different, mm -hmm. what I mean. Um, yes. And there's nothing, how should I say, you'll celebrate when you're 76 and you get to the age of 77, you celebrate being alive and in good health, and you know how lucky that is. Um, so that comes into the equation, which was never there before. There's a reversal of roles slightly on birthdays. Um, when it's her birthday, um, I try to, I mean, I do the breakfast every day anyway, so that's not special. But the presents and the cards are all in her place with some flowers, because her birthday is April 22nd, so there's always daffodils and there's always primroses and stuff like that, and which she loves. I think the thing is to remember each time that that's what the person loves. What she likes is flowers, yeah. all right? Yeah. And, and me to be nice, by and large, those two things. So I make the breakfast, but then I also make the lunch and the dinner, um, which is a sort of a tradition. I'm not sure she likes it very much because I have to ask her constantly whether I should put that in a bit longer. Is it cooked yet? So I think sometimes she thinks it's probably better if I do it myself. <laughs> anyway, that's the sort of tradition we have. This is a sort of jokey thing that goes on. Um, we have stopped really giving each other presents. The deal now with presents is, and that's become a bit of a tradition, is that when it's her birthday, she gives money to the charity that I choose, and I give money to her for the charity she chooses. So that's quite a nice exchange now. So it's, we exchange that sort of thing and, and flowers. Um, and, of course, then it's phone calls. It's phone calls which are lovely for her birthday, so her children ring and her grandchildren ring. And she speaks to her great-granddaughter as well. So there's all that. Um, that's so lovely. that's the sort of routine. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and obviously, um, routines are all out of kilter now anyway, aren't they? But is this time giving you an opportunity to write and to just have time to reflect and write because I know that you take yourself off to be able to write um yeah. but but often you uh, you've said that you have um you hear a story or something triggers um yeah. your your first yeah. thoughts into a story is that yeah. different or are you is that no it, it's the same um, it's, it, it, I have no frustration at the moment at all normally as you say, some some little thing will trigger a story. It'll be a picture I've seen, something I've seen as with the butterfly lion out of, out outside a window. I saw a, a white horse on the hill outside a place called Westbury, and I was reading a book about white lions at the time, and I thought, hang on, I'm going to have a white lion on the hillside. It's those sort of moments which can begin in your head, the telling of a tale or the weaving of a tale together. Um, and then... Actually, I need time for that, I call it dream time, for it to take root a bit. Um, and once the, the roots are there, the story, and I can't leave it alone, then I'm looking desperately sometimes for the weeks and months I can have for sitting down and writing. Yeah. And what's happened this time, which is different, is that I've been thinking of, for some time now, uh, retelling the tales of Shakespeare, um, which is a big thing to take on, taking on quite a responsibility, um, and it's got to be done the best you possibly can. And in a way, I wasn't daring to do it. I kept reading his plays and thinking, well, can I really do this? And um, what's the point of it? And self-doubt creeps in. And then suddenly I'm in this situation where um, I'm home. I've got a, the plays of Shakespeare in the house. I've got a copy of uh, Charles and Mary Lamb's um, Tales of Shakespeare, which is in a sense what I'm doing again a couple hundred years later and retelling them 
in the language of today. Mm. And I sat down right at the beginning of this, in the beginning of March, roughly, and thought, well, actually, do it. You've got time now. It's going to be difficult to get into the tone of it and the rhythm of it. But the wonderful thing about this, and there is a wonderful thing about it, and I know there's suffering going on and it's dark and difficult and people are grieving. And we've just lost a really good friend last week. We lost a really good friend to this thing. So it, 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 it's pretty, it's affecting almost everyone. Mm. It's, it's got that hovering on. And what's wonderful about this is it takes you out of that world. It's like reading a good book, like reading a good story. I'm deep into whatever it is, King Lear. And you might think that's quite depressing. Mm-hmm. Well, it, 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 it's uplifting in the sense that you've got a job to do with it. And a great sense of achievement after 10 days or so when I'd finished the retelling of King Lear. And then I thought, well, then let's do something to cheer me up a bit at the end of that little Midsummer Night's Dream, and you're off into a fantasy story. Mm-hmm. And so I've had a wonderful few weeks, really. It's been a, it's been a joy. Um, and I've got, I think, three or four more stories to do now. And then I've got other things almost like queuing up. I don't, you know the inside of a hen? It's yes. Quite interesting. <laughs> it's this line of little eggs waiting to come out. And the one that actually comes out that you might eat for your breakfast is is fully as it should be, it plops out, and then you can crack it open, have your breakfast if you want, or you can leave it to be hatched, fine. Um, But behind that one, there are several queuing up at different stages of growth, from a tiny, tiny little thing, hardly visible, a little bigger one, then a bigger one, and then a bigger one. And my stories are like that. Mm -hmm. They do queue up a bit, and sometimes they jump, which I know hens, eggs don't, but they they sort of jump the queue a bit, and they Mm -hmm. come out earlier than you thought. This one has been a tiny, tiny little egg. This Shakespeare idea has been a tiny little egg for about 10 years. Mm. Will I do it? Yes, I'll do it. No, I can't do it. And bit by bit by bit, now it's grown. And then the time is there. This wonderful opportunity to have it literally months when I can't go out. Even if I want to go out, I can't go out. I mean, I have to go out for a walk each day. Otherwise, I um, wouldn't be in a very good state. So go for a walk is fine. And I can stroll around the garden and I can dig the vegetable patch and I can feed the birds. But otherwise, my time's my own, really. So I've been, it, for writers, I have to say, and composers, people like this who spend their time with their head inside a room quite a lot, it, it, it's not bad. It's not terrible. Yes. I, I mean, I, I feel quite similarly because I absolutely get that feeling of things queuing up. Um, and I have it for theatre shows and for stories and what have you. Um, but also my writing, which is always, oh, yes, I will do it. I will do it. Um, and this is definitely giving me that possibility in a way that I, do, I, does, I didn't have the um, discipline, maybe, to put other things aside and do it. But I suppose for me, it's also interesting, this idea of being challenged to look at creativity in a different way and to challenge myself and, and the wizard team yeah. to work online and to work in, in a different well, I, medium. And I that, think you're right. Yeah, that's I think, quite it, a, a yeah. lovely challenge to have, but also well, yeah, puts me right out there. It's important for you and all theatre people because yeah, you're a storyteller, actor, and you make plays. Though That's kind of how your world is. The problem you've got, which is slightly different from mine, is that there aren't audiences at the moment. There will be in time. It's it's a question of getting around. What one must remember, and I'm learning it from Shakespeare, is that they've had plagues and pestilence before. Mm -hmm. We are almost the only generation that has never known it. I mean, the last big one in the world, as we know, is in 1918. That was a huge, huge one. But there have been others since. We've been lucky enough, you know, SARS and things like that did not come here. It didn't affect us at all. So we got this mindset, well, hang on, we're safe. You mm. know, that's, all old, that's all old-fashioned stuff. Read Shakespeare. Mm. That man lived through plague and pestilence. Mm. During his time, before his time, and since Shakespeare's time up there, it, it's been about for years and years and years. You know, it's not an accident that he uses in um, uh, Romeo and Juliet. There's this thing, a plague on both your houses. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the plague is there. It's in his metaphors. It's because it's in the air. They've lived with it and they died from it in vast, vast numbers. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting time um, for theatre not to say, oh, this is impossible. We haven't got any audiences. Shakespeare must have thought the same time because I'm sure his plays were closed down from time to time when stuff happened. I'm sure they were. Mm-hmm. And 
you, yes, we've got to close down for a bit, but it will come back. The yeah. fear will dissipate. Maybe there'll be a vaccine. Maybe there'll be a treatment. And I, you know, in a couple of years, these theatres have got to be open. We need our stories told to us in this way. We know you and I know how important it's not just for our own lives. We know how important it's for the audiences and for the children. Yes. And I, and I think it's also about reinventing and investigating and um, finding other ways. Because I look at, um, there are a lot of people, as you say, in pain and suffering, but those people who are lucky enough to be able to be well, to be able to um, uh, enjoy some rest and recuperation what people are going towards are the arts you know they're reading uh, yep. they're watching they're taking in um yep. all of the the arts and beyond our health which obviously is is first and foremost i think arts and artists are crucial for us to understand the world to make sense of it as you, and, see, you know and, Shakespeare and, gives us and, an and understanding for our, and from mental health Yes. I mean, you know, what, what the wonderful thing about theatre, the wonderful thing about books is that when you get lost in a story uh, and in the people who make the story, what does it do? It makes you feel you're not alone in the world. Mm -hmm. You know that other people are going through this stuff as well, whether it's laughter or it's tears. Um, other people are living through it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can live other lives, go other places. It takes you out of yourself. Yeah. And just at the moment, I think there are an awful lot of, children who must be going through quite a lot and there may be after effects we don't even know about yet yeah uh, in many many homes and stories really can be help they like when I mean, the best stories and you do it all the time i assume you're doing the storytelling and effectively what you do in front of an audience is you hold out your hand and you say take my hand i'm going to take you through this story mm. well what is a story a story finally teller is a friend who's going to take you through a story and out the other side and then give you back to yourself. But meanwhile, you'd have been on this journey um, where sometimes you do need a bit of support because there's difficult and dark things in it. Mm. Um, that's what storytellers and writers do. And incidentally, I'm not quite sure. You'll have to explain to me what the difference is because I don't know. Wow. Is there a difference? No. I have... And doing this Shakespeare thing makes, is really interesting, actually, because what you discover when you retell Shakespeare is that I don't think he... I could be wrong, there'll be some professor shouting at me, but I don't think he ever wrote an original story in his life. He was retelling stories, retelling history in his own way, which is, of course, what writers do the whole time. You take things that are true yeah. and you turn them with your own words and in this case with his genius. And I mean, we wouldn't know that there was a, a king in Scotland called Macbeth had it not been for Shakespeare. No. You know, this, it, it, all these things are really, really important. They've fed our whole world. Mm. We call it culture, but culture is one of these words that's a bit like treacle. You know, it, it sort of soaks itself into it. It's not culture, it's our lives. Mm. The, the, they, 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 these, these things get into our lives. And the other thing that's brilliant about Shakespeare and stories is that we share them. When you were telling your story, and last time I saw you was in London at the at South Bank, um, and you were telling your story, there were huge numbers of people there. And Everyone in that room was sharing the same story, living it in their mind's eye as you told it, making what you were saying come alive for themselves. Um, so storyteller, playwright, filmmaker, writer, I think we're, we're just all doing the same thing, only in slightly different ways. I, I agree. I agree. And I think what's also wonderful about um, reading or uh, going with a storyteller is that, as you say, you're hearing the same story, but you're taking it in and your imagination is then really stimulated and working in order for you to smell and hear and taste and imagine all of those pictures and that every single picture um, has its own nuances and its own special flavour for each person. I love that. And I love when people come up and, you know, when I did Why the Whales Came, um, people would come up to me and say, um, we used to live on Briar or we went to um, the Sillies for our holidays and, and, and you took us there. Yes. And of course they that's... Make, yeah, they make, they make the link, but... The, to make the link, which is what you do, because I've seen you quite a few times now, um, 
What has to happen with storytelling of any kind is that whoever's doing it has to mean it. Absolutely to mean it. So I think children are fed up, just as we all are, when politicians start talking and we know actually they're doing it for another reason. Mm. If in fact children know, as they're listening to a story, well actually this is only because you're going to get questions asked about it afterwards. Many of them, not all, but many of them just switch off. You know, this is, this is a, a teacher's tool and that's fine. Mm. They know that, they get that. That's not what stories are for. The stories are uh, to get lost in. Yes. Uh, and and I, think, I think we really mustn't use, whether they're plays, whether it's Shakespeare, whether it's what you do with your stories and mine, and these things are not to be used. They're to be yeah. literally drunk in and become yeah. part of you, really. And, yeah. and then you dream about it afterwards. After leaving one of your shows, what you really want and what I want is when anyone's finished one of my books is that they close the last page and your guys walk out and you have not answered all the questions. Yeah. You've set them wondering. Yeah. Them thinking that's the great thing thing we must do with it and and that will only happen if they get the feeling that this was genuine yeah. that you really meant it when you took the hand and walked them through the story you were a friend during that time and they were listening to you and that's what a writer should do as well really and um and it reminds me when i work in schools i'll often say to the teachers please um don't ask questions straight away about the stories please let them sleep on it because I think actually there is a majesty in the sleep process, but also in that percolating of the story so that it can make its way down into your heart without asking questions, which takes you straight back up into the head and into the thinking realms. It's like stories yeah. have a way of just, oh, magic uh, can well, happen when, we don't, when yeah. we don't try and analyse them too soon. Or use them. I think it's the using and the analysing. I know when I was teaching, and I did for about eight, nine years at the Coalface, and I had this wonderful head teacher, a uh, lovely lady, she was called Mrs. Skiffington, at a school in Kent Primary School. And she got us together once, all the teachers, and said, look, at the end of every day, I've been doing something wrong. I've been teaching 40 years or whatever it was. We try to teach them after last playtime, from three to half past, we teach them. Well, I'm here to tell you, she said, they don't want to learn anything. They just want to go home. They're yeah. tired. Yeah. We are tired. So what I want every single teacher to do is to read or tell a story in the last half hour of the school day. And then she wagged her finger at us and said, and don't afterwards ask them questions about yeah. it. And if you want to finish it, finish it. If not, let it go on like a soap to the next day. Yeah. But when the school bell goes, um, off so that they walk out of that playground with the story still in their head and that's that, that i think she was right you know you, it was a wonderful wise, advice wise woman. Wish men, our present minister of education and others that follow him would adopt this because i do think um stories and i think are thought of in two ways either as fodder for mm. comprehension and grammar and stuff like this mm. or they're thought of as entertainment mm. just entertainment they're much much more than both those things that doesn't mean to say they should not be used for either of those things yes. or thought it's just that they are born that they're bigger than that yeah and just to me the, li the library should be the center of every school that's the heart and soul of any school is the yeah. library yeah. um and not because there are lots of computers in it with lots of books as well not either or both these mm -hmm. things are both important um anyway i mustn't wait yes. i get very no, I mean, well, I do too. I, I mean, we could go on and on, couldn't we? I, I was thinking also, um, you know, in this time of, um, of shutdown and lockdown, um, uh, stories um, being so crucial, but also how um, being in nature and how much nature has um, seemed to open up and blossom and rejoice from our um, stillness. Um, and I know that for you, you know, having the farm for city children is really, really dear to your heart and um, and how important it is for people who don't have that opportunity to be able to come and be in nature. And it must be um, quite heartbreaking for you that children from inner cities at the moment can't come and be in nature. Yeah. It's been a hard time and it's going to be a hard time, I think. I mean, I last saw, Claire last saw the children walking down the lane here in the first week of March. Mm. And they had sacks over their back and they were going out to feed the lambing sheep with the farmer. 
which is the kind of sight we see every single day. So they come for a week with their schools in London, Birmingham, Bristol, Manchester, all sorts of places. Anyway, the school from London. And I knew as they were going away, because we knew we were going to have to close down, I knew those were the last children I'd be seeing for some time. Yes, we had to close our doors. And what that means for a charity, of course, is that um, whilst we can fundraise, which we're doing like crazy, um, quite a lot of our funding comes from the schools who send their children down. It's not much, yeah. because it can't be much, but it's something. So yeah. we have to find, I like a lot of charities, we've got to find a lot of money. So we're spending quite a lot of our energy now, Claire and myself, and the charity itself, Farms and City Children, all the people who work there, keeping everything going. So all the farms, the three farms, one in Wales, one in Gloucestershire, and the one here, which we began over 45 years ago. And we've had, what, 100,000 children have come mm. down to the farm. So it's been going a long time. We know it works because the teachers come back and back and back, the schools come back and back. One teacher once told us you can learn more on a week on the farm than in a year in the classroom. And they're not the only person who's said that. Well, I, I think you've said that in I Believe in Unicorns. I did, You can, yes. learn, one, you can yeah. learn more from one day in the mountains than you can from a whole day. Isn't that Thomas's father who says I, that? I, I picked that up from that same teacher. Ah, and I think it, it's nice. so true, being out there in this environment where you feel you belong, where you feel this is mine, this is the countryside, these are the hills, the woods, the flowers, the birds, the fish, yeah. what... All these things you see which you don't see normally opens the eyes and opens the hearts of these mm -hmm. children um, to discover more, that's for sure, to learn to care for it, also to learn where their food comes from. It's a whole week of intense learning, but without them ever knowing that's what they're doing. Yes. They're just, yes. they're the ones who pick up the eggs. They're the ones who drive the sheep. They're the ones who clean out the milking parlour. They do it and do it and do it. And at the end of that time, they know what work it takes to make food and the responsibility of the countryside. So they plant trees whilst they're here and all that sort of thing. Yes. So yes, we're closed down. We hope we're going to be welcoming children back probably early next year now. So there's a big gap of a few months and we've got to find the funds. So we're working like crazy to do that. I have to say, we're encouraged by one thing. Now, about 20 years ago, there was a terrible disease, which you all know about, but some watching might not, called foot and mouth. And foot and mouth disease came to this uh, area. And so we had to shut down. No one was allowed in at all. Yeah. Every farm was off limits. There were piles of straw soaked in disinfectant. No one was allowed to go through. And the worst thing of all, you'd look out of the window, and this little room I'm sitting in now, you'd look out of the window, and you could see smoke drifting mm -hmm. down the Ottman Valley. And these were the sheep and the cows that they killed and were burning. So it was a heart-rending time, and of course, without the children. And for nine months, again, there was no money coming in, and we had to fundraise and fundraise. And there are wonderful people out there, uh, watching this maybe, who were supporters then. And they gave their money, their five pounds, their 10 pounds, their 100 pounds. And we managed to get enough to open up again. And on we went. And that's what we got to this time. It's like theatres. You know, we're no different from most other charities. And it's certainly no different from theatres, which are shut down now because they have to be. They have to be kept going. I think all, all these really important parts of our lives, yeah. which involve people's jobs as well. I mean, that's one yes. thing you won't forget. These are, we employ 60 people in this charity. Mm. Um, but they're going through hard times now. Yeah. Uh, although the government um, has helped a lot for the moment to keep it all going. So we just got to try, try, try all we possibly can. Great determination and faith so that we're here January, February, when these children come back and I see them walking down the lane and they've got sacks on their shoulders and they're going to feed the next lot of sheep. Yeah. So it's a big thing in life. It's the best story um, I've ever written. And I had mm. quite a lot of help with that story from other people too. But um, because it's, it's real. I see it every day and I see the good that it does and the joy that it brings. And, um, and I, I'm, so, um, I'm so connected to that. When, again, when I go into schools, one of the things that I feel... Um, I often talk about Grandmother Moon and uh, Mother Earth, Brother Wind, um, because when we talk with our young children about, um, you know, when, when we use metaphors and we, and we help them to understand that Mother Earth takes care of us and Grandfather Sun shines down on us, that we care about the world. Yeah. And so as children get older, um, they then want to fight for the world and to help yep. the world to survive. I think it's really important, that connection <clears throat> to the Well, they won't. The truth is they won't want to unless they love it in the first place. Exactly. And that's what an experience like this helps to do. But it is also true that so many children now have caught on to this, whether they've been to this farm or not. There are literally millions of children all over the world now. 
who do know through extraordinary people like David Attenborough, who have actually shone the light on the great problem that we've created in this world. Yeah. And it is children who have led that. And I feel that's the great hope of us. That's, 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 that's our children. And the more we encourage them in that, I think the better. Can I, am I allowed to read you something that I've just written about this world about me, or, or would you rather I, would, I did? I would absolutely love you to. Yes. Um, and um, will you introduce it? Um, I will. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I will, I will, please. I will. I, I, yeah. Well, look. I think because of what's going on around us and the sadness, I wanted to write something which lifted spirits and took us away from ourselves and made us think, if you like, of the bigger picture. And so I write this, I called it um, a song of gladness. I like the word gladness. I don't know why I do, but I really love the word gladness. So I'll read it and <clears throat> see what you think. Well, before I do it, I've, we mentioned this business of um, standing and staring. Um, every morning I, I go out and I um, pick some kale because we have a kale smoothie for breakfast and we grow it in the vegetable garden. And I pick some kale. And every morning, a blackbird has been greeting me. When I walk outside in my slippers and the gym jams and I go to the vegetable thing, there he is sitting on a branch singing at me. And I sing back. Now, it sounds sentimental and silly, but I sing back. And I know he hears because he sings back with the same tone. We try to imitate each other. I think a lot of people have done it anyway. So I wrote this because of that blackbird. <clears throat> A song of gladness. I've been talking every morning to Blackbird, telling him why we are all so sad at the moment. He sits on his branch and listens. It was Blackbird's idea. He sang out this morning at dawn from his treetop in the garden to Fox, half asleep behind the garden shed. She thought it a good idea too. It was a wake-up call. Fox was on her feet at once and trotting through Bluebell Wood, where she barked it to Deer, who ran off across the stream. Kingfisher was there, Otter and Dipper too. They heard and piped it on, and Swallow swooped down <coughs> over the meadow and passed it on to cows waiting to go into their milking, and to sheep resting quietly under the hedge with her lambs in the corner of the dew-damp field. And they all agreed bleating it out to bees already busy at their flowers, to weaving spiders and grasshoppers and scurrying mice. Trees heard sheep calling to the whole flock of them and waved their budding leaves in wild enthusiasm. And high above, the clouds <coughs> wandered through the skies, driven by wind, and wind took Blackbird's idea over the cliffs, across heaving seas where gulls and albatross cried it out, and whales and dolphins and porpoises heard it and wailed and whooped it down into the deep where turtles listened and they too loved the idea. So did plankton and every fish and crab and sea urchin and whelk. They all whispered that it was a fine notion, the best they ever heard. And the whisper went over the sea on the curling waves to the shores of Africa, where lions roared their approval and elephants trumpeted it, leopards yawned it, water buffalo belched it and dogs yelped it. Wildebeest murmured it out across the savannah and storm lifted the idea up over rainforest where rain took it and poured it down on gorillas in the mist, on chimpanzees in their sleeping nests, and Crocodile swished his tail in his swamp and clapped his great jaw shut, smiling at the very thought of it. Howler monkeys and gibbons echoed their calls loud over all the earth. They are that loud. And then, from far up high, Sun heard it too and shone it down over deserts where Oryx stamped her foot, impatient to be getting on with it and doing it. She loved the idea that much. Even Camel, who rarely joined in anything, thought this was the best and the most beautiful idea he had ever heard. Back in the garden, Blackbird waited until everyone was ready. And then he began to sing. And the whole carnival of animals, every living thing on this good earth, joined in until the globe echoed with the joy of it. 
blackbird was very pleased. But I was still lost in sadness as I heard the earth singing around me. It was a song of forgiveness. I knew that. So I asked Blackbird if I could join in, and he sang his answer back to me. Why do you think we are doing this, you silly man? We want you and yours to be happy again. Only then will you treat yourselves right, and us right, and the world right again, as you know you should. Only then will all be well. Sing, silly man. Sing, sing. Our song is your song. Your song is our song. So I sang. We all sang. Sang away our sadness. In every house and flat and cottage we clapped and sang. <clears throat> in every hut and tent. In every palace and hospital and prison. And they heard. And we heard our song of gladness. Echoing all together in glorious harmony. Across the universe. There you are. That's what blackbirds can do. Gosh. <coughs> Difficult to speak after that. It's beautiful, Michael. Thank you. You should make one of your story shows of it. Wouldn't that be lovely? I would love to. Wouldn't that be great? Yes. Well, we have said we're going to work again together, haven't we? I, we I'm, uh, I, I, I'm letting... It's one of those... It's one of those chicken's eggs that's making its way out, isn't it? Let it be, let it be a little one right at the back. That, no, well, I don't know. It'll it keeps, take, it, it, it keeps trying to it. jump. It keeps trying to jump. Um, so I, um, I'm going to be sharing the, um, the Noah's Ark um, section of I Believe in Unicorns. Oh, yeah. Um, which is all about the animals. Um, yeah. and, and so um, I will... I'll, be sharing that after this interview and okay, um, good uh, but i think i think i may have to wait a little while because i think um the song of gladness needs to just percolate um yes. some well, more. rather I, I i should tell you i don't know if i told you this before but there was um i own uh the way i use now you use that story of noah's ark in i believe in unicorns it came from a tiny, tiny little black and white drawing from a magazine which you will only find now in very um, second-hand bookshops, a magazine called Punch. Yes. And in Punch, I don't know how long ago, I mean, it must be 60, 70 years ago, I saw a, a little image, tiny image, which I've never forgotten. It was of a unicorn standing on top of a rock in the middle of the sea, so the top of a mountain. And he was rearing up and looking at Noah's Ark going away into the distance. <laughs> so nothing is new. You know, there's that. And from that, all those years later, I mean, really 50 or 60 years later, whatever it was, I had, it helped me to sit down and write, um, you know, the unicorn story. Wow, and, and I completely, well, you know, I completely love the story. I love, it's such a privilege to to share it. Um, well, it's incredible. It's lovely that you do, Daniel. It's really lovely. Every time I've been, it's an, I'm enchanted. And I tell you what I'm particularly enchanted by. Um, I watch you do it, and I watch this extraordinary way the story is, it, it, is, it sort of comes out of piles of books and behind this and behind that. And I'm always waiting for something to go wrong. I'm always waiting for a pile of books to fall over, for you to step over something and trip or something. And you never do. And what's really interesting is that the children are completely, the first time you pull something out of, they're completely entranced. And you hold them. And I've seen kids in there two and a half with their mouths wide open. And granddaddies of 80 or 90 sitting there as well, completely entranced by the manner of the storytelling. It's so inventive and so wonderful, and it just holds people still, still, still. So I really love seeing it, and it's um, and I love listening to the silence of the people around me. The silence in a theatre is when the people are really, really silent, and as the world is silent at the moment, you know people are really locked into the story. So it's a, it's a joy to be there always. Oh, well, as I say, it's just a privilege to share it. I love it. Yeah, I love it. 
And um, I, the only thing that I just want to say, thank you so much. It's been um, just uh, as ever a joy to chat to you. And I learn lots and I laugh lots and I, you know, feel so much um, and, you know, often shed a tear. So thank you so much. And I'm, um, I'm launching tomorrow um, a, uh, a special birthday competition. So it's called the Splendid Story Adventure. We're going to launch it on our Wizard Presents Facebook page tomorrow. That's wonderful. Um, and it's um, a competition for people to um, uh, enter to possibly win a storytelling adventure session with me over Zoom uh, at a birthday party. Oh, that would so, be great. Um, yes. Wonderful, wonderful, so, wonderful. Well, good luck with it. Good thank luck with you. It. Um, and I and I will um, take inspiration from you and your storytelling, Michael. Thank you. All the best, and I with from you as well. Bye bye, Daniel. Yeah. Thank you so much. Lovely to see you. And speak soon. Speak soon. Love yeah. the family. Bye bye. 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 bye.